This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. With high school students mulling over which college to attend next fall, prominent legal scholar and educator Lonnie Guineer says the admissions testing system is all wrong. Progressives are up in arms about new trade agreements on the table. Labor sociologist Chad Broughton tells us what NAFTA did to a once thriving Midwestern town. And Bill Press talks with Vermont Congressman Peter Welch about Cuba. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Legal scholar Lonnie Guineer says the SAT and other college admissions tests are simply a proxy for wealth and that universities thus do not train people to contribute to society. And we say hello to Lonnie Guineer, the Bennett Bosky Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She became the first woman of color appointed to a tenured professorship at the Harvard Law School. She is a leading expert on race in America and the author of a new book, The Tyranny of the Meritocracy, Democratizing Higher Education in America. Professor L- Lonnie Guineer, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. You make the case that that testing in high schools is class-based, but isn't academic advancement open to anyone if they can perform? Well, it it may be true in some other context, but not in the context of higher education and the, the challenges that are required in order to be invited into opportunities to go to college or to go to law school. So um, when I say that testing in high schools is class-based, part of what I'm saying is not that a high school that's a private high school is necessarily better than a high school that's a public high school. My point is that... um, the testing effort or the the testing preoccupation is done in a way that um, encourages competitive individualism in which each person is trying to compete to be the best person in the class. And that may be useful in in some contexts to engage students to get their attention, to give them a sense that they too can um, succeed. But if we're preparing these same students to be active participants in a democracy, then it's also important to teach them how to work with others, how to um, identify other people's potential contribution to a collaborative effort and to use that interaction, not to dominate, but to create, to um, encourage people to experiment and to um, encourage people to work together and to see that even though neither of the two people or or of the three people are the best, but working together, the three of them uh, solve the problem because they each have something different and something special to contribute. Is the SAT exam merely a proxy for wealth? Well, I don't want to um, diminish it entirely, but yes. Yeah. And by that, I mean that the exam is is best um, handled by students who have been able to go to schools that teach them how to take the exam and that give them opportunities to practice taking the exam so that they feel confident and comfortable when they take the exam. Other students who know the answers or who could easily do better on the exam are not prepared to to succeed because they haven't gone to a a test prep school or um, after-school program that costs money. And so 
the test becomes a, a way of testing wealth rather than testing merit. We're speaking with uh, Harvard Law School professor Lonnie Guinier, author of a new book, The Tyranny of the Meritocracy, Democratizing uh, Higher Education in America. How important is it really where a high school student goes to college? It, it isn't the key to professional or, or perhaps career success based on the reputation of the graduate school? Well, it depends what um, you know, what someone's goal is, but I'm not sure I um, completely understand the question when you say um, that the key to professional or career success is based on the reputation of the graduate school. I don't think that that's... Um, Does it matter which graduate school somebody goes to in terms of the, the, the interpretation maybe if somebody goes to Harvard Law School versus, say you know, pick another law school that may not be as well known. I'm sure there's some of that, but I don't think that that's the essence of or the the, the central point that I'm trying to make, that if you want to do well in life, you have to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm saying is that Harvard, as well as um, Columbia or Yale, may be able to recruit a um, a, um, a, a a potential group of future leaders, but so may the University of Massachusetts be a place where potential um, leaders are also being educated. I, I, I'm not sure, um, uh -huh. or, or I'm not trying to say that this is all about going to the right school in order to be the right person to get the best jobs. That's one way of looking at it, and I think that that's undemocratic. What I'm suggesting is that in a democracy, our goal should be to educate everyone as best as we can because there there is a range of aptitude in our society, and it's not simply based on parents' wealth, but it becomes a, um, a protocol or a... Um, a measure of parents' wealth by the amount of money they have available to invest in preparation to go to Harvard or preparation to go to Yale or preparation to be admitted to um, Dartmouth or to Stanford. And my my point is that the mission of higher education is should should be a goal that um, invites all of our citizens to participate in education as a means of not just um, projecting or in increasing the um, amount of money that they can make, but in also giving them an opportunity to understand the values of a democracy and to become better aware of their own Ch uh, challenges, but also their own uh, potential contributions. So here I'm thinking of something like the Posse Foundation, where they work to, to, to develop a group of students, 8 to 10 students or 10 to 12 students, each of whom is contributing something to the Posse, and each of whom is benefiting from this Posse, from this group. But they're not each one exactly the same. They're not each one getting the exact same grades, but they're a group of people that work together to solve problems in a way that each person is making a contribution to that problem-solving effort. And in turn, everybody is successful. Well, I, ca I can't say everybody is successful in the sense of being equally successful, but yes, everybody is everybody benefits from that interaction. Sure. Now, you have an interesting view that opposes affirmative action, at, at least in college ad admissions. Can you explain the problem as you see it? Well, the problem that I see in the, in the context of affirmative action is not that um, affirmative action as a term or as a, a concept is a problem. It's the way in which it's administered. And I became much more aware of this uh, when I first got to Harvard Law School, and a young woman came to me from Harvard College. 
she was from North Carolina. This was a black woman. And she was telling me that at Harvard College, when she walks around the university, people ask her, you know, what her name is and where she's from. And when she says North Carolina, they say, no, where are you really from? And by that, they mean that many, if not um, a, a large percentage of the students who are benefiting now from um, affirmative action are students who come to the United States from other countries. So you have students coming from um, the Caribbean, students coming from Africa. I am not opposed to that at all, but I don't think that's a stand-in or an excuse for not also admitting students who are from um, generations of, uh, of of families who were at one point slaves in the uh-huh. United States or who have, in other, for other reasons, lived in um, an environment in, where they, in which their parents were not able to uh, go to college or to, um, t- to live in a, you know, a lovely house. That the, the the point is that the way in which affirmative action is being administered is a problem to me, not the idea of it. Sure. Now, you are a, a, an expert on voting rights. Are you at all optimistic now, given the Republican Congress and Supreme Court? <laughs> Am I all optimistic about what? <laughs> about anything, given the Republican <laughs> Congress and the Supreme Court. <laughs> And I, I don't mean I don't mean to make a joke of that, but uh, you know it's. Washington Post had an interesting statistic the other day that after this this Congress now is made up of eighty percent white, eighty some odd percent Christian, eighty percent male. Um, oh. The Supreme Court has 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 moved in a much more conservative direction, generally speaking. Um, you know where. That's where I wonder where where your optimism may or may not be. Um, as we move forward? Well, I'm optimistic about this country in that I believe it has the ability to take advantage of its resources. Whether it does, that's something I don't have control over. Sure. And and, and can't predict. I do think that... Um, it, that one of the most important interventions right now would be to emphasize a, a more democratic and um, collaborative understanding of problem solving rather than thinking about the way how can we solve problems in a way that competes with somebody else just for the um, pleasure of being better than that person. So I do think that this is a moment where we can begin to emphasize the the power of working together with other people rather than the um, significance or or the self-importance of being the person with the best grades in the school. That if, if, if we as a society are going to solve many of the challenges, global warming, for example, or if you're asking about what it's like in Boston right now, that's the opposite of global warming. (laughs) (laughs) But I, I, I I, I, I think that it's really important to encourage people to work together to solve problems rather than to encourage people to, um, to take tests or to compete for positions that will ultimately allow them to brag about themselves but doesn't necessarily prepare them to make a useful contribution to the larger society. Okay. Lonnie Guineer, Bennett Bosky, professor of law at Harvard Law School, author of a new book, The Tyranny of the Meritocracy, Democratizing Higher Education in America. Professor, thank you so much for your time with us today on americasdemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you. You're quite welcome. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? 
You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Sociologist Chad Broughton examines the tragedy of a major American manufacturer moving to Mexico and blames it on NAFTA. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. As an old country saying puts it, money is like manure. It does no good unless you spread it around. Yet, America's corporate and political leaders have intentionally been shoveling wealth into an ever bigger pile for those at the top. They've gotten away with this by lying to the great majority, which has seen its share of America's prosperity steadily disappearing. Yes, they've told us the rich are getting richer, but that's just the natural workings of the new global economy in which financial elites are rewarded for their exceptional talents, innovation, and bold risk-taking. Horse duties. The massive redistribution of America's wealth from the many to the few is happening because the rich and their political puppets have rigged the system. Years of subsidized offshoring and downsizing, gutting labor rights, monkey wrenching the tax code, legalizing financial finagling, dismantling social programs, increasing the political dominance of corporate cash. These and other self serving acts of the moneyed powers have created the conveyor belt that's moving our wealth from the grassroots to the penthouses. Not since the Gilded Age, which preceded and precipitated the Great Depression, have so few amassed so much of our nation's riches. Having learned nothing from 1929's devastating crash, nor from their own bank failures in 2008 that crushed our economy, the wealthiest of the wealthy fully intend to keep taking more for themselves at our expense. This is Jim Hightower saying, now, however, the people are on to their lies. Polls show that two-thirds of Americans support increased taxes on millionaires, an end to corporate tax subsidies, and policies to more evenly distribute the wealth we all help create. This rising egalitarianism shows the true American character, and it's changing our politics for the better. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Labor sociologist Chad Broughton has done a case study on how NAFTA helped shift bargaining power away from unions to corporations. And we say hello to Chad Broughton, senior lecturer in public policy studies and academic director of the Chicago Studies Program at the University of Chicago. He is also the author of a book about the de-industrialization of America called Boom Bust Exodus, The Rust Belt, the Maquilas, and a Tale of Two Cities. Chad Broughton, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks so much for the invitation, Jim. Absolutely. Nice to talk to you. Um, Your book takes a very personal look at the people involved in the move of a productive economic engine, a Maytag plant, from Illinois to Mexico. But it was only a small part of a very large trend. Is that right? Right, right. We've heard about deindustrialization since the 1970s, right? But it, it wasn't until the early 2000s that we saw its most devastating losses in the 2000s, we lost 5.8 million manufacturing jobs, and most of that was before the Great Recession. And that, so that, that number is just amazing, I think. It's one-third of the manufacturing base in this country that we lost, and one of the main reasons why inequality is growing in our country. You know, you hear a lot about the 1% and the 0.1% getting all the gains, and that's true. But what also um, contributes is, this gutting of the lower middle class that happened during the 2000s. Uh, that also contributes to growing inequality. And so, you know, of course, when people end up working at Walmart or Lowe's or the dentist's office or whatever, as some Maytag, former Maytag workers did, they make much less. Uh, you know, one couple I'm thinking of here is, 
is um, the Cummings family, who, when they worked at Maytag, uh, combined to make about $76,000, and they now earn about half of that at near minimum wage jobs, about $37,000 a year. So when I hear about the erosion of the middle class or growing income inequality, I think about this couple who is, you know, now struggling to raise two adoptive children. And so I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because good jobs are so important, not just for, you know, income and security, but as the basis of an equitable, well-functioning society where, you know, everybody feels like they're contributing something and that they're being treated fairly. So, so when a business like Maytag shifts jobs overseas, we lose not only a productive engine in our economy, but also pathways for people to successfully contribute to society. And ultimately, this book is, you know, asks some fundamental questions about what kind of society we want to live in and who the economy will serve. And in recent years, have not been good for those of us who value good jobs, uh, equality, uh, fairness, and so on. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's it's. I don't think we we take that all into consideration. The fact that the you know the company goes away, the people are left behind, and and they perhaps mm-hmm. don't have other skills that where they can just jump into another job, or even if they do, maybe there's not a job there for them to get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Um, from the fifties to the eighties. Americans doubled their income, and each level of income increased at the same rate. But since then, we all know that economic growth began flowing disproportionately to the top. How did it happen? Yeah, that's that's a tricky question. Right, right. So, yeah, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the post-war uh, years were, were great across the board. Um, you know, the rising tide really did lift all boats, as Kennedy said. Um, uh, but, yeah, there was a dramatic change um, in our political system in the 1970s. Uh, there was um, uh, what Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson in their excellent book, Winner Take All Politics, call an unseen revolution in which organized business interests like uh, the Business Roundtable, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, along with wealthy conservative activists and well-funded think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, all these um, sort of political actors grew their influence in Washington. And so the result of that was decades of policies that, you know, beneficial to business, including the rewriting of rules on taxes, financial markets, executive pay, and so on, while policy generally became less generous towards the vast majority of Americans and was harmful to labor. Um, so I'd recommend to anyone interested in this to, to read this great book, Winner Take All Politics, to kind of look at that, that evolution in our, in our political system. And, um, you know, they, they show how the, the policymaking playing field tilted in favor of business at a time when the United States was entering this rapidly globalizing economy in, in a way that benefited economic elites and hurt workers. And so the interesting conclusion then is that uh, economic globalization is not the problem per se, but rather how the American political system failed to respond to it. We're speaking with Chad Broughton, uh, the author of Boom, Bust, Exodus, The Rust Belt, The Machilis, and A Tale of Two Cities. Um, Chad, you make the case that the end of well-paying jobs and quality products began when corporations started serving their stockholders instead of the customers. Can you explain that a little bit more? Oh, sure. Right, right. I do make the case in the book that there was a shift in the late 1990s in which uh, the business class and investors began to focus more narrowly on the bottom line and took an increasingly short-term perspective. Uh, You know, this was the era of the tech boom and a proliferation of television stations that watched sort of every tick of the stock market, if you'll remember, you know. And a lot of conservative Republicans feel the same way about about this change towards short-termism, as it's sometimes called, Um, you know, when the number crunchers took over from the kind of the traditionalists. And, And they argue themselves that, American business lost its way during this time and became less competitive because they were there's a lot of cutting of corners to, to make those quarterly numbers. You know, um, John S. Reed, 
who is a former chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, himself said that in the 1990s, the investors sort of took over. Uh, before that, at companies like Maytag, it had always been about the customer, the customer, the customer. Um, but there, there was a cultural shift from a focus on quality products to this sort of obsession with company share prices. And that spelled the, the end for Maytag which was this icon of traditional Midwestern capitalism and, and quality products. Is anybody anywhere in the world making quality products that anyone can be proud of? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think so. I, I'd say two things. I think in the big picture, the United States is still neck and neck with China in terms of total manufacturing output. Um, these, two, these two countries are at the top of the world by far, way ahead of Germany and Japan. Um, in manufacturing. It's just that we do it now with fewer people. Um, the era of you know, massive factories like this Maytag factory in, in Western Illinois employing thousands of people is, is, is waning in, in America. But it's, it's just not true to say that America doesn't make stuff anymore. You know, in the United States, workers make heavy farm equipment at John Deere in Illinois. Uh, they make um, Honda Civic hybrids in Indiana. Uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, for example, luthiers make um, beautifully handcrafted Gibson guitars. So uh, America still manufactures. Uh, and, and the second thing I'd, I'd say about that uh, is, is that, you know, not just about factories, but about in individuals making quality products. You know, in some ways, uh, there's more room than ever to be creative for individual producers today. Um, a lot of people make their own, say, craft beer or their own handmade jewelry or build their own furniture in their basement. There are now ways to, you know, share information on the Internet and ideas about making stuff and, and so forth. And, and, you know, what you can make on a computer, for example, from designing your own home to making your own songs is in some ways, at least for those who can afford the tools and the materials, is, is in some ways revolutionizing and um, democratizing even production in, in some ways. You know, you mentioned the the uh, home brewers and, and, and things like that, mm -hmm. and, and you, there there is an industry that is really starting to boom now with these little tiny brew pubs, and they're not mm -hmm. they're not producing a whole lot. They're not selling necessarily over state lines, but typically within states. It's a big business in a, in a, in several different parts of this country, and I'll be curious to see if other businesses can do the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's what we're seeing now, kind of smaller producers popping up here and there. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where where that leads. And how long they can last if you're only, you know, because there's always that demand. Oh, we want more. We want more. We've got to grow. We've got to grow. But that's, you know, that's, that's right. probably a good problem to have. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, in right. retrospect, Chad, it, could unions have done anything to prevent the move of American companies to cheap labor foreign countries? And then perhaps looking ahead, is there any hope for a reversal of the trade flow? Well, I'm not sure about unions, but I think the federal government could have done more to help. I mean, part of the problem is that employers provide retirement and health benefits, whereas in other advanced economies, those responsibilities rest with the government. Therefore, in the United States, there was a stronger incentive for companies to close union shops in order to unload the health care and, and pension obligations that they had to workers. So um, single-payer single health insurance, for instance, would help make the U.S. more competitive globally, I think. Um, and in terms of reversing the flow of jobs, that has started some. There are many companies that are bringing back jobs to the United States in this trend called reshoring. It's unclear now how big this trend will become, but it is a trend. Um, you know, there are companies like GE and Caterpillar that are bringing jobs back to the United States. And I think the United States needs a forward-looking industrial policy focused on um, you know, high-tech, advanced manufacturing, like in green energy and, and other kind of uh, advanced areas like that, to build on um, uh, for, for the future and, and build on this kind of trend of uh, reshoring American jobs. And I could give you an example, actually, of that, a really interesting example in Newton, Illinois, where um, 
which was where the uh, Maytag uh, co Corporation was headquartered. Um, There's an old laundry factory there that was closed down a few years ago. Now, in this sort of, I would say, innovative federal, state, and local effort, Newton's becoming a center now for green energy manufacturing. In that former Maytag laundry factory, there's now a company making wind towers. So that's where I think we ought to be headed as a country, and the federal government needs to play an activist role, I think, in helping these industries get off the ground. Are we permanently in a world where the only jobs will be in the service and high-tech industries? Because that doesn't bode well, I would think, for anyone without a higher degree. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really key point, I think. Those good jobs in Galesburg at the Maytag factory were replaced mostly by lower-paying jobs in the expanding kind of low-pay sector of uh, the healthcare um, industry and also in the rural educational system of Western Illinois, and also in retail jobs like at the grocery at grocery stores and at Walmart or Lowe's or something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the important statistic to know here is that 63%, 63% of American workers do not have a college degree. So um, we're in an economy now in which the majority of American workers are being left behind. So I think we need policies that will help um, workers at or near the bottom to do uh, useful and meaningful work and be able to provide for their families. You know, most everyone wants to be useful and valued for the work they do, of course. Uh, and, and also be able to put food on the table. So uh, raising the minimum wage, indexing it to inflation, uh, expanding the earned income tax credit are two policy options to help um, in all these sort of minimum or near minimum wage uh, job sectors. Um, another is free and low cost training for um, the development of medium skill level jobs like in um, radiology or HVAC repair or welding and those kinds of uh, medium skill level uh, jobs. Now, before we let you go, how does this flight of American capital and know-how affect the foreign workers it's supposed to help? Yeah, so this, yeah, the book is A Tale of Two Cities, so half of it is about the Mexican side. So I'm glad you asked that. Um, I think a lot of... Um, I think a lot of Americans don't realize that a lot of the stuff that we buy is made in the Mexican border cities, from flat screen TVs to paperback books, from vacuum cleaners to women's intimate apparel, to respirators, all kinds of stuff is made in um, this place that I study, Reynosa, Mexico, where there are some 96,000 people working in this huge complex of factories right down there across the border from um, the southern tip of Texas. So people have come uh, from the Mexican countryside to work in these factories for about a dollar and a half an hour and, and generally have to work overtime to make ends meet. Uh, the work doesn't pay very well, but at least there's steady work at the border um, compared to rural areas, which has been really kind of devastated in the last um, 20 or 30 years since NAFTA. Um, but uh, so I've studied uh, these these workers in these border factories, and, and they, they go through this massive change when they, they move from a rural economy to the, the U.S.-Mexico border. They, um, they face a completely different life uh, in these highly disciplined uh, modern factories, but also in these highly chaotic, um, booming Mexican border cities. So, you know, all in all, it's a mixed bag for the Mexican factory workers in, in Reynosa, I'd say. Uh, many of them find it difficult and choose, you know, life difficult at the border, and so they choose to risk it and move across the border into the United States, of course. You know, uh, when the American people were sold NAFTA, we were told that it would reduce immigration, um, you know, by then-President Bill Clinton and also the Mexican president, Carlos Salinas. They both said the same thing. But it did the exact opposite. It displaced millions of impoverished rural Mexicans and pushed them north, to the border cities and beyond into the United States. And so now we have 6 million undocumented migrants in the U.S. and an immigration crisis. And NAFTA is partly to blame for that. Time for us to start rethinking NAFTA, it looks like. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'd say. I'd say. Yeah. Chad Broughton, Senior Lecturer in Public Policy Studies and Academic Director of the Chicago Studies Program at the University of Chicago. And his book, Boom, Bust, Exodus, The Rust Belt, The Maquilas, and A Tale of Two Cities. Chad, thank you so much for your time with us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Look to have you back here sometime soon. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. All right. Thank you, Chad. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Congressman Peter Welch of Vermont. One thing uh, nice about being right here on Capitol Hill, uh, just down the street from the United States Capitol, is every once in a while we can snag a member of Congress, <laughs> convince them to stop by before they go to the office. Congressman Peter Welsh from Vermont uh, is kind enough to do so today. Hello, Congressman. Nice to see you. Bill, you got it wrong. I mean, it's like flies to honey. We just like to come here. Oh, <laughs> I'd like to think that, but thank you, sir. You took a very interesting trip over the uh, break with um, Senator Pat Leahy. <clears throat> who went to Cuba and brought Alan Gross home and then went back, and you were with him on this trip. Uh, I'm very excited. I'm going to Cuba in May, right? So what did you find? What's the the mood down there? I think there's a couple of things. Number one, there's enormous excitement that uh, the United States, with President Obama's decision uh, to normalize relationship, uh, that is really exciting for Cubans. You know, we are traveling around, walking on the streets of Havana, wearing our uh, Cuban and American flag lapel pins, and people are just coming oh. up to us. My wow. wife was with me. She's a very fluent uh, Spanish speaker. And they were, like, so excited uh, that they were going to, what they hoped was really? going to be yeah. a much more normal relationship. So Rubia doesn't like it, but the Cuban people do. Uh, so that's really exciting. But this is a Cuban, you're not talking about, necessarily government officials. You're talking about people in the street, Everyday right? folks on the street yeah. were really, uh, really excited. And we, you know, as you know, in Cuba and Havana, it's very safe. You can walk around. Yeah. People are friendly. Uh, it's obvious that you're uh, an American. And it allowed for a lot of interaction. So it was unfiltered, unscripted, and uh, a really upbeat reaction. The Cuban officials, we've got a long way to go. But first of all, you know, the uh, opponents of this here, I want to talk a little bit about that. They think this is a concession to the Castro brothers. This is a threat to the Castro brothers. Of course it is. I mean, you're going to have travel down there. You're going to have more tourism. You're going to have more educational exchanges and potentially, and this will be a challenge, but potentially we're going to have more commerce. And that's going to create a dynamic in Cuba that's going to make it much tougher for the Castro brothers to have this iron-fisted control, which they do have and is really uh, really tough on the Cuban people. In, in fact, what people don't, these the Rubios of the world don't realize, is that the, the, the embargo has benefited the Castro brothers and the, and the high, higher-ups in Cuba and has really hurt the Cuban people. You know, that's exactly right. Because uh, the Castro brothers are doing fine. Whatever it is they want, they're going to get. The Cuban people aren't. Uh, It's a very poor country. So we want to punish the Castros. We don't. But we punish the Cuban people. It doesn't make sense. The second thing is that that embargo makes no sense. And it's become an excuse not just for Cuba but for a lot of the Latin American countries to give a pass to Cuba when it comes to human rights. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been democratization in several of the other Latin American countries, uh, but at the UN and in other forums, they'll frequently side with Cuba really as a a, a, uh, protest about the U.S. embargo. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the significance of our changing policy is that as long as that embargo was in place, the Castro brothers had an argument uh, that the U.S. policy still was Bay of Pig style regime change. Uh, and the president's renounced that. Uh, uh, you know, we don't have an embargo with other countries with whom we have profound no, disagreement. They used so a, this I, is I, good. I learned when I was down there that they used the, um, they, the, uh, the Fidel was in mm-hmm. charge, was still in charge when I was there. They used the embargo as an excuse 
for denying a lot of opportunities and privileges and rights to the Cuban people, saying right. we're in a state of war. That's exactly right. Because the embargo is an act of war. And we and played into their hands. We played That's right exactly into their right. hands. Yeah. So, you know, I think the, the the wonderful thing about this is that it's a stupid policy. As the president said, it didn't work for 50 years, so why keep doing it? Now, that being said, you know, and there's a lot of hope in the Cuban people, it's going to be tough. And I'll give you a specific example about commerce. First of all, we met with dissidents. Senator Leahy always insists that you do that, and we mm-hmm. did it before we were going to meet with President Castro, and they canceled the meeting. And that was a protest, uh, in effect, because they do not want outside official groups meeting with Cuban dissidents. Who so, canceled the meeting? Well, the Cuban ministry. Oh, they did? Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, there was never, you, because you did this, we'll do yeah. that. But it was pretty clear. And Senator Leahy, of course, every time he's gone, has met with Castro. He was the one who went down and brought Alan Gross back yes. along with Chris yes. Van Hollen uh, and Jeff Flake, a really good mm-hmm. uh, Republican from Arizona. Uh, but we went down there in in the spirit of openness, uh, uh, we told the Cuban folk, uh, the officials that we were going to meet with dissidents that uh, we I did once before with Senator Leahy, but we did it before the official meeting scheduled with uh, uh, the, uh, with the officials mm-hmm. the next day, and we had a lunch meeting with uh, the foreign minister. That got changed to a 3 p.m. meeting instead of lunch. Uh, we did get uh, coffee, uh, uh, and then the uh, pl- the hope for a meeting with Castro never materialized, and there was a lot of protest from uh, the Cuban officials about us having met with the dissidents. Uh, so there's still a lockdown mentality. A second thing that was interesting, uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow and I went to the uh, Ministry of Agriculture to meet with their top people. Both of us are interested uh, – uh, she is the chair of the Agriculture Committee in the uh-huh. Senate. In in the, uh, farm Vermont. exports, I guess, right? <clears throat> yeah, we were interested in that. And you got a portrait into how tough it's going to be to solve the practical challenges of being able to, let's say, export a tractor from the U.S. to Cuba or dairy products uh, from Michigan or Vermont. You know, right now, Cuba imports dairy from New Zealand. Now, Vermont's a little closer. So is Michigan. And in order for them to import something... Like the ministry would like to be able to work with us, uh, let's say a tractor. It's not just a farm deciding, hey, we're producing and we can afford to buy a tractor. In fact, it'll help us produce more. If they want a tractor, they've got to get permission from the Ministry of Trade. Then oh, the Ministry well, of Trade has to go through this long process to decide whether the Bill Press Cooperative or the Peter Welch Cooperative gets it. There's no connection between the decision to purchase it yeah. and the user of it. So you can just see the enormous bureaucracy that's in but place. But all of that is going to fall, don't you think? I mean, I do eventually. Once but the I opportunities think... are available and more opportunities are available, it just, how, they, can't, they can't sustain that system, it seems to me. Well, they can't sustain it because one of the contradictions, if you're in Cuba, that's 11 million people, they've got tremendous soil. And they've got a history of being able to produce uh, what they need for themselves. Well, they import food. I mean, that's an indictment of the economic system. Sure. Uh, that's a poor country that's literally importing dairy instead of producing dairy from New Zealand uh, in other foodstuffs. So it's an indication of how the economic system is not working. And it's not as though the folks there don't need things to do, work to do in productive activity. So this is going to be a real challenge. You know, the Castro folks, you have to, there, there, is, there are things that they're proud of, and rightly so. Education is improved. Health care is improved. Uh, and those are achievements, and that's mm-hmm. beneficial. Uh, it's a safe place, uh, but there are not civil liberties there. The uh, first step, uh, it, from what I've read, seems to me making the American interest section in Cuba actually an American embassy, and the same thing here, that we have a Cuban embassy uh, I know there are some talks last week. Um, how, how soon do you think that before that, that happens? Well, it's easy to be done because all we have to do is change the sign. Yeah, you've you know, got a big folks, building yeah, there, right? we've got a big yeah. building, and, and, you know, you and I can pay for the sign, and we'll go down and put it up if that's I'll what Senator Rubio to. requires, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so it's a simple thing. You give it to me. I'll take it down in May. I'll hammer it up there myself. And it's not really a budget thing because yeah. we have a big active uh, interest section there. 
uh, and we have our With, uh, intersection uh, building, which would be the embassy, and we have which is uh, a big embassy. building there. And you've got I don't know what a hundred people or so down there. It's yeah. it, it, in that na- uh, neighborhood, I think. And then we have an uh, in effect an embassy. It's the residence for. The, the, our person in charge down mm-hmm. there. It's where we had our meetings uh, with the uh, the Cuban dissidents. So everything you need infrastructure-wise is there. You basically just have to change the name. And I'm not quite sure uh, what congressional action is necessary, if any. But, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Even on the Republican side, you're seeing uh, uh, Rand Paul saying, what's the big deal? You know, and Marco Rubio obviously has got legacy politics with uh, that's, all it, folks. that's all it is with him. It, yeah. it is, and it's it's not about rewarding the Castros. The point you made, and I agreed with, that this is a threat to the Castro brothers. I think that's what people have to come around and see. Uh, what's in our interest to do? What's in the interest of the Cuban people to have a shot at having a more open society? It's, I think, more commerce, more trade, more interaction, uh, more economic opportunity. And I think this new policy... Uh, if we can get it implemented, is much more uh, potentially productive than the embargo approach. Uh, it's very exciting and long, long overdue. Um, uh, I, I was so pleased to see this change in policy. I, uh, I, Back in the Clinton days, I personally lobbied President Clinton and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and said, now's the time to do it, now's the time to do it. And uh, they didn't, and neither did George Bush, and now... Finally, President, President Obama has. You're, you're right. Long way to go on this, but the process has started, and uh, it's not gone back the right. other way. I, think I mean, Marco right. Rubio's got to realize he's out of step on this right. thing. Already lost that argument. The sole congressman from Vermont uh, here in studio with us. Uh, I want to talk about State of the Union, but first, uh, Congressman, if we can, out in Hollywood, California. Jim has a quick comment. Hi, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Hi, hi Bill. I just wanted to... Uh to go ahead and, and compliment the congressman on having uh, having it right on the nose. Uh, I was I led a group of 15 members of Veterans for Peace to Havana last week, and we uh, oh, great. we met with Cuban veterans. We met with Cubans on the street. Those people on the street are just ecstatic about what's going on. They see this as a tremendous opening. They see the the people uh, from the United States coming. Uh, a woman sweeping the uh, <clears throat> sweeping the Plaza de Armas in Havana looked up at us and said, "Are you the Americans?" <laughs> and, uh, and we said, "Well, we're some of them. There's more to come." But uh, the uh, Marco Rubio knows nothing, of course, because he has never been to Cuba. That's an interesting little point that he Cuba are. Welping, welcoming Americans with open arms. Yeah. They want more trade. They want more uh, interaction with us. And they're extremely happy at both our government and their government with what's going on. Yeah. Hey, Jim, thanks for that first, uh, first person uh, report. Uh, they're going to see a lot more Americans coming down there. And I think the more, inter, uh, more exchanges like that. The better. Uh, in the arts and business and what, whatever, right? Baseball. Uh, baseball. Thank you. Yeah, baseball. the better. And and uh, the more of those exchanges, the, the faster that whole right. uh, old system just breaks down and more opportunities the Cuban people will have. Uh, overall, State of the Union, you were in the chamber um, as a progressive. Uh, happy with the present State of the Union? Here's the question. Where's that guy been? Yeah. It, was, it was great. No, I tell yeah, you, there, I were, there were two things I thought that were really terrific about it. Number one, uh, the president really gave an explanation. You know, a major challenge and opportunity and responsibility for the president is to help us understand what we've been going through. And he just laid out historically what happened after the collapse of Wall Street. And really, and frankly, uh, the peril we were in, uh, some of the ugly mm-hmm. things that we had to do in order to stabilize the economy. Uh, and it put in context a lot of the things uh, that we had to do. And we're at a moment where with gas prices down, uh, with unemployment real down, I think for the first time people are starting to think that maybe uh, they'll be part of the What the president focused on is the unfinished business of stabilizing is to give America a pay raise. So mm-hmm. all of the policies he announced were about pro-growth, uh, pro-pay raise, uh, economic policies for the middle class, the folks right. who have not benefited from the recovery. So I thought it was really good. I thought his policies that he proposed were practical. 
Yeah. And it puts uh, I think it puts him in play uh, to be a relevant and strong leader for the last two years of his right. administration. You know, he, he really set the foundation, I think, as you pointed out. We, we've made all this progress. Still a long way to go. But we've made a lot of progress. Now we have an opportunity, as he said, to write our own future. Right. And we ought to focus on – for the last six years, the top 1% have done very well. Let's focus on the middle class. He called it middle class economics. That's right. Which is sort of, you know, a, a, a pseudonym for um, income inequality, whether it's the focus on that. And you're right. And he laid out some specific proposals to deal with it, all of which I thought were practical and made sense. They, they are. They're, you know, how, you, how do you make a college education affordable? How do you help folks who are working uh, deal with the challenge of uh, child care when, uh, uh, when they have a child? Uh, uh, how do you deal with a tax structure uh, that has been a di- di- a digging deep into middle class pockets and give them the relief and, and instead of maybe having to go one elsewhere. one part that uh, didn't ring so true with progressives free trade authority well, the fast know, track fast track authority it doesn't that's true but you know let's be candid here every president uh, Democrat and Republican always takes a position that they they've got to promote it. trade. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a surprise, and there's going to be a debate within the Democratic Party about that, and the Republicans, by and large, endorse it. Uh, and all, all trade agreements are not the same. He leveled with us on that. I mean, mm-hmm. he said they're not all the same, and he thinks they don't live up to the hype at times. So really, the devil is in the details. You know, yeah. Fast Track Authority, which I oppose, is very, very uh, 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 scary because that's the vehicle by which some bad stuff gets in there. You don't have mm-hmm. a chance to uh, look at it in the light of day. Well, Congressman, you have a chance to talk to him a little bit about that because he is on his way back from Saudi Arabia, or, or will be soon, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, arrives here tomorrow. And then Thursday, he will be joining you and your Democratic colleagues up in Philadelphia. That's so right. Have a good time up there. We'll talk to you. Uh, we'll get the full report yeah. uh, after the retreat. Good. Look forward and to thanks so you. much for coming in this morning. Thank you, Bill. All right. See you in Cuba one of these days. That's right. That would be fun. Plaza de Armas. <laughs> yeah. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Lonnie Guineer, Chad Broughton, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect...